It's a regular meeting of the Guam Public Utilities Commission. It's 6.35 p.m. September 29th, 2022. All commissioners are present this evening with the exception of Mr. Mike Pangolina. And uh, first order of business is approval of the minutes of May 26, 2022 and June 16th, 2022. Motion to approve that subject to corrections. All in favor say aye. Aye. The motion carries. Next item is GSWA docket 2201. Petition for extension of the Lizone Operator Contract with Green Group Holdings, LLC. We have an ALJ report and a proposed order. Fred. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. This matter comes before the Commission upon the petition of the Solid Waste Authority for review and approval for certain amendments to the Lake John Landfill Operator Contract. Uh, at present, the operator of the contract is uh, GGH Guam, and uh, the contract will expire on September 30, 2023 in another year. But the petition here seeks to extend the term of the contract through September 2026 and to implement certain cost savings provisions through contract amendments. And these are all advantageous to the Guam Solid Waste Authority. The contract provisions will also promote the efficiency of landfill operations. GGH Guam has been the operator of the Lejeune Landfill since 2013. And without going into a lot of detail, this is a very uh, complex task that that entity has to operate and manage the landfill. The contract is 138 pages, and it in detail explains all the duties of the operator and the tasks that must be performed. In the proposed amendments, GSWA and GGH Guam have agreed to exercise the second five-year renewal option and to amend certain sections of the Lake John Landfill contract. Uh, the, the amendments were approved by the Board of Directors of Guam Solid Waste on July 27, 2022. Now, if the uh, contract is extended, that is for at least three years, and the contract amendments are approved, approved the cost will be $11,655,720.05 over the uh, uh, additional term of the contract. GSWA is asking first, as I indicated, just to extend the term of the contract, and that would be from October 1, 2023 through September 30, 2026. And uh, that is authorized. This extension, the second extension, actually, is authorized by Section 2.02 of the contract, which uh, authorizes a second, second renewal term. So the fact is that uh, solid waste has a legal right to extend the contract for a renewal term, of course, upon the agreement of the operator of the land. There are several reasons why I've recommended approval and believe that uh, it is good sense for solid waste to continue with its current operator. Guam Solid Waste Authority is satisfied with the current operator services. GGH Guam has experience in operating the landfill, having been the operator since 2013. And finally, under these circumstances, it doesn't appear prudent to require another bid for solid waste to go out on bid, which we know is a complicated process, uh, fraught with a lot of potential difficulties. Now, in the amendment to section 2.02, the contract could actually be extended up to four years. Right now, the extension you're approving will be three years, but the contract has a provision 
that the parties can subsequently agree to extend the contract further from October 1, 2026 through September 2027. And uh, they will determine whether that will be done by January 31, 2026. There are certainly cost reductions that will occur during this renewal term. These are various amendments that the parties have already agreed to. Under the contract, the main fee that the operator is paid is the base operating fee. And in the original 2011 contract, it was set at $2,871,680.72. The fee can increase based upon tonnage and and other pass-through costs. Each year, the operating fees are adjusted by, by an adjustment factor. And this is kind of a CPI index increase based on some different indexes, uh, including employment cost index, construction machinery and equipment uh, indexes, and diesel fuel. Uh, So the point is that every year, based on those indexes, the the contract uh, operating fee could be increased. But in the proposed amendment, uh, the parties agreed to immediately roll back the current base operating fee by 7.323%. And that was one half of the most recent CPI adjustment. And that would apply uh, to the remaining unbilled months of the current contract year and would cap any future adjustment during the extension term to no more than 5%. Now, uh, it's pointed out by solid ways that already this adjustment is in effect even though the amendments haven't been uh, fully approved yet, the operator has agreed and has reduced the operating fee by that amount. Uh, The 5% can vary under uh, certain circumstances. There's a further formula that's been agreed to in the contract amendment. Solid waste indicates that the rollback of that operating fee by 7.323% will result in an overall reduction in cost in the amount of $6,364,998 for years 2022 through 2026. So it seems that this contract amendment definitely a good thing for the Solid Waste Authority and it helps to cap Uh, the CPI increase, and we know that in these times of inflation, uh, it's certainly beneficial to have some provisions that will at least moderate the impact of inflation. In the present contract, uh, after the operator had received and landfilled a tonnage of uh, acceptable waste exceeding 80,000 tons in an operating year, they could they could charge additional fees but now with a proposed amendment to section 3.01 c it will provide that the operator will accept a hundred thousand tons per contract year and uh, after that hundred thousand is exceeded they receive additional compensation of twenty five dollars uh, for tonnages exceeding that level so again This is a a beneficial provision for solid waste. There are some other provisions that provide for additional soil cover for placement by the uh, operator over cells one, two, and three. And I won't uh, go into detail on those, but they are also beneficial. They provide additional protection uh, for the uh, cells. All of the foregoing proposed amendments are justified on the grounds of cost reduction, enhancement of services by the operator, and efficiency. It was also my finding that the renewal of the existing contract is in the interest of solid waste and the ratepayers. And I, I have to say I've reviewed a lot of government contracts in my time. This one is one of the most detailed of all, and it It's a pretty fair contract, actually. It imposes a lot of duties 
some stringent requirements on the operator, but uh, at the same time, it's fair. It uh, seems to protect the interest of the rate payers and solid waste. So I think that um, the contract should be uh, renewed. It, it is to the benefit of solid waste and the rate payers. Again, I, I, in my report, I went to a lot, a lot of analysis about the provisions of the contract, the duties of the parties, but I won't um, repeat them now, only to suggest that I think it, it is a, a good thing for the commission to consider consider the contract in effect. So, of course, based upon these determinations that I've, I've given you tonight, I recommend that you approve the extension of the landfill contract for the period of three years with the option of the parties for an additional year and that all of the other uh, provisions um, related to the amendments to the contract be approved and that solid waste be authorized to extend up to the amount of $11,655,720.05 for the extension of the contract for fiscal years 2023, 24, and 25. Thank you, Brett. Is there anybody from solid waste here this evening that wants to address this at all? Uh, yes, good evening, uh, commissioners. My name is Sandra Miller. I am an assistant attorney general with the Office of the Attorney General, and we represent the Guam Solid Waste Authority. Present with me here tonight is Ms. Catherine Jokigi. She is the controller of solid waste. Um, and I thank you, Mr. Horecki, for that very thorough and concise summary of the petition and what is, yes, indeed, a very long and complicated contract. Um, we would just, uh, without repeating anything, we would just like to emphasize that uh, the three things that went into the negotiations, and these were negotiations that began uh, earlier this year, I think it was March, so sometime around March, um, but they were all mutually negotiated at arm's length in good faith between Solid Waste and GGH. Um, and GGH was more than reasonable. Uh, it, it, it seems like solid waste and the people will come out on top because there is going to be a significant financial savings. Um, the the, the non-financial matters such as the soil cover on weights on, the additional tonnage, all of those serve to extend the life of the landfill. Um, while the new cells are being built, and the, I think that's in 2025. So the longer um, we can extend that, uh, the more beneficial it is. And definitely the rate players will come out on top because um, with these savings, the, the, the rate, the current rate uh, for the tipping fee uh, can be you know, pause. We, we don't have to really go into uh, raising rates or look at that at the at the moment. And in fact, um, our priority right now is to continue building lakes on uh, cells, the, the new cells that are currently under construction. Um, if the commission has any uh, questions about the details of the financials, you know, I will turn it over to Ms. Kikiti to answer those questions and she is prepared to provide the commission if it desires, you know, with breakdowns of the particular, um, uh, you know, forecasts as to the savings and, and how much um, we, we can, there's a, there's a, I'm sorry, and it's, I'm forgetting the fancy accounting terms, but uh, I'll turn it over to Ms. Kikiki. Thank you. Good evening. So, um, does anyone have any questions with regards to um, how uh, we came up with six million dollars of savings for the duration of the second renewal term? Does anyone have any questions? So that was just based on the rollback, right? Uh, the, was there like an anticipated increase in the contract for the extensions, and then they decided not to do the increase? 
that 7%? It's kind of a, a combination of both, but uh, it's primarily uh, the increase of the threshold of the tonnage. It used to be we will pay excess tonnage, everything, anything over 80,000. They have increased that to 100,000. So we're, you know, we don't have to pay that excess tonnage fee until we exceed uh, 100,000 tons. And we've been averaging less than that. So that, that, that one, uh, just that, um, just that section, that amendment, we are able to realize almost 500,000 of savings this fiscal year because they also agreed to make it effective as soon as possible, which is this year. Well, savings and, um, and uh, rate pauses are always a, a positive for the commission, so. Yes, uh, <laughs> we're, and, we're very and excited. And Mr. Reckie did a thorough report, so if there's okay. no other questions, I'd like to move to the group. Okay, go ahead, Doris. Three bond, the 2019 bond, all it did was pay for the construction of cell three. Of cell three. Just that. Yeah. Okay. So with your tonnage, of, okay, because I was really surprised that you had to go out so soon for a new cell. So the question related to that is uh, when cells one and two were initially planned, and then you had to go out for cell three, was that? ahead of schedule, sooner than anticipated? Uh, I believe it was within the ballpark. I, I initially it was like it's between nine to 10 years for the life of- On average? Yes. For one cell or for two cells? But see, from, from what I heard, if you combine cells one and two, it doesn't necessarily mean times two. It's, it's uh, cell three is supposedly bigger than the normal one and two if you divide it by two. Does that make sense? So with cell three, I believe the life is supposed to be between nine and 10 years, but one and two was shorter. Yeah. So are one and two completely closed? Uh, we, no longer in use? It's, yes, that it's no longer in use, but it hasn't been completely closed. I'm, okay, yeah. so you're now using cell three? Correct. When do you plan to go out for cell four and five? Or, or, or what is your plan? Because you have to go out for the bond in order to build cell three. And the price is going up and all. When do you anticipate going out for uh, uh, cell four? At the moment, uh, we're having our rate study done. Okay. And then uh, we're assisting also financial advice in terms of our finance planning. and. To build the next cell. So, so it's not in the immediate future, that's no. in the next two or three years. No, not at that. Okay. No. So the other question I have is uh, the debt service on the new, uh, the additional cell, okay, back in 2019. Yes. Who's paying for that? Uh, right now it's uh, Gulf One, but we do have a continu continually uh, agreement that we reimburse uh, Gulf Guam, which we are. So, uh, we are paying for self three by reimbursing uh, general fund because uh, we we were we didn't have the capacity to issue bonds. We don't have credit, so uh, Gautam was the one that issued the bond for us with the condition that we have the continuing agreement that we reimburse Gautam. So okay. we've been paying for it. So, how much is the debt service for this bond? It's around three million a year. So you are quote, able at this time to at least pay for that bond. Yes, yes, okay. no, we we can afford that. Yeah. Okay. 
through 2025. And some of these projects continue for up to eight years. Uh, in 2021, Docomo has continued to expand its network uh, with regard to undergrounding of aerial network island-wide. And uh, it's provided uh, more access for the, the fire and police departments and also on uh, Route 6, Mayena Hill. In years 2022 through 24, Docomo will continue the expansion of fiber undergrounding in central, southern, and northern Guam. And in 2025, Docomo will de uh, deploy fiber to the home island-wide. Now, you're gonna hear me speak some more about fiber to the home, but this, this is the kind of new technology and investment that these companies can make when they're provided with the universal support funds. I find that uh, all the requirements for the USAC certification have been provided by Docomo. They provided all the information, no outages, no unfulfilled requests for services, um, no complaints before a regulatory body. But based upon the record that was before me, I recommend that you approve the certification and uh, upon your approval, then the chairman will sign the uh, certification for Docomo. Thank you, Fred. Any comments from the commissioners? Doris? Yes, this is just a, a general comment, more of a briefing type of comment. Uh, what are each of the respective carriers' plans in this area of 5G? This is, this is, oh, I'll repeat the question. What are the respective carriers' plans in the area of 5G. If you could just give us a general update or overview on it, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the question. James Hoffman, Chief Legal Officer of Dokumo Pacific. Um, I'll sort of field it from Dokumo's perspective, and then my counterpart here, I think, probably has some thoughts uh, as well. Uh, so 5G is obviously the next iteration of the development of high-speed mobile uh, and fixed um, data transfer. Um, it is being rolled out primarily right now in South Korea, Japan, some parts of the United States, uh, Europe. Um, and the ecosystem that sort of supports 5G, you've heard of the, the term Internet of Things. This is the idea that your refrigerator is connected to a device that then sends a message to your cell phone and tells you that you're out of milk. Um, things like that. That ecosystem uh, takes a longer time to develop. And so when people talk about 5G right now, we're mainly talking about um, increased wireless speeds, um, but it will eventually, uh, in Guam as well, um, come to encompass more of a comprehensive sort of mesh network of mobile, fixed, and IoT uh, applications. Um, we recently <coughs> participated, all of the carriers on one participated in a FCC uh, 5G auction. Um, that auction um, went in some interesting directions. Guam actually, uh, the amount of revenue generated by that auction, Guam accounted for almost 10% of the $427 million in that auction. Uh, and so that spectrum is regarded as very valuable. It's, it's prime real estate. There's a limited amount of it. Um, and each carrier uh, pursued uh, the acquisition of that spectrum um, quite, quite vigorously. Um, and so both of us, and GTA as well, um, I think I remember the hearing last year where uh, I think 5G uh, is common to all the carriers. It's no secret that is the next iteration of the technology. Um, it does depend on spectrum, obviously. You need to own the spectrum. Um, and you also need to build out your network in terms of the antennas and the, the capabilities, um, both on the wireless and what we sometimes call fixed wireless side, which might provide service to a home um, or to a business. Um, and so that is the next sort of frontier, and we are all pursuing it very vigorously because eventually that's the types of speeds that customers will come to uh, expect as, as the new normal. So, uh, so still in the planning phase. So right now, as we sit here, um, 
Steve will correct me if I'm wrong, but Docomo is the only uh, carrier of the, the main three on Guam that has deployed commercial 5G, both, Guam, both in Guam and in Saipan. Um, but I expect, particularly in light of the results of this most recent auction, that uh, our competitors are not far behind, and I think we will see probably fairly soon, although I'm not privy to their plans, but I would not be surprised if by you know, let's say the middle of next year uh, or sooner, uh, all three carriers are going to roll out 5G services. The, the challenge right now, and again, this is not any sort of competitive secret, is that it's very difficult to charge consumers extra for 5G because that ecosystem is not completely developed. And that's not that's not only here in Guam, that's also elsewhere. Um, once that becomes, as I say, sort of the new expected normal, carriers will then build that into their plans and probably have a tiered rate plan similar to what we have now with 4G LTE technology. Um, but it's still sort of in its infant stage, I would say, here on um, one, but it is coming. So, so you said you have rolled out a uh, commercial 5G? Yes, yeah, since 2019. Okay. It's, it's very localized, though. Um, mm -hmm. The equipment is still expensive. The spectrum is expensive. And so if you go down to the um, to Lower Tumon, we have a site, a 5G site there. You may notice, if you have a dope on my phone, um, that it will switch over to a 5G. We have one at our headquarters, and then we have uh, a couple others, one at UOG and, and one in Garapan. It's, like, it's limited. So for those clients that do are you take, are, are paying for it, we, we don't actually charge. We don't actually charge them for it right now. Oh, I see. It's, it's because so we're building it out. We're still building. Okay. So you. It's a bonus. So in the next two years or so, it will be fully deployed. I would expect that. Uh, well, that we're it, it, well no, it's okay. It, it, it's it's less. Of I think everyone's rushing to put it out as soon as possible. It is extremely expensive. There's a lot of back end work to it uh, that goes along with it. Uh, process, but I think we're all working to get it out as soon as possible. As James mentioned, there's no additional increase, so whether you get 4G or 5G, the rates are still the same, but our expenses have gone up incredibly, and uh, not in terms of only equipment, but you mentioned fiber to the ground, we're all putting fiber in the ground, we try to support the back hole to make it work. And we appreciate the uh, commission support of the USAC funding, and the FCC is looking at a, a revised funding plan called Advanced 5G, but that's been delayed. Uh, I mentioned that last year, and it's still been delayed, but that's going to be the follow-on to this current program that we're doing, and we appreciate ALJ Hurricane's uh, uh, diligence in processing our applications, and we got to really it. We, we couldn't get done without this extra help, and uh, it really makes the difference. And, uh, we have real strong network here in Guam, every whole of us. So we're glad to provide that service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I believe Pedro has a motion. You don't have a motion. Yeah. Yeah. And then you did, so. No, yeah, no, this is a different. That was for the GSWA. So this particular one, I'll move to the group docket uh, 2201. Okay. He makes the motion. Pedro, second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, James. Thank you, Docomo. Thank you, Coach. Next item is PTI Docket 2201, Petition for Annual USAC Certification. We have an ALJ report and a USAC certification. Fred? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. So, of course, the same requirements that I covered with Docomo apply here. Mr. Carrera, as the general counsel of PTI, has certified that the nine required services are provided and that all USAC funds are only used for the provision of those required services. Also, um, IT&E or PTI has um, indicated that actually they invest far more funds in their system than they receive from USAC. So USAC helps, but it's not, it's not by itself sufficient. Uh, during the reporting period, BTI also made a lot of improvements in existing sites. So they have installed a number of additional sites, improving coverage and performance. Uh, they've added
added additional carrier capacity for a number of, of sites, and they added a MIMO, multiple input, multiple output, a wireless uh, technology to uh, long-term evolution of sites to improve throughput and edge of network coverage and performance. In 2022, uh, they added new, new sites resulting from the iConnect acquisition. And they do have uh, uh, more provision for LTE and 5G upgrades. So they've mentioned 5G also. And in 2023, they're continuing with adding sites to improve coverage, cell sites, and uh, for faster and more reliable home internet services. A number of new sites additionally. And um, they're continuing that for 2024 and beyond. beyond additional sites and additional capacity. So I think their, their five-year plan does satisfy the requirements. Uh, my review says that they've met all the requirements under the federal law to be eligible, and uh, I recommend that you approve their petition and approve the uh, certification that I've submitted. Thank you, Fred. Any comments from the commissioners? Mr. Ferreira, do you have any comments this evening, or you good? No, but I just want to say thanks again. And this goes a long way, but it, it's really just a small portion of the money that all of us put out uh, to build these networks. Uh, just incredibly expensive. Thank you. I just have a quick question. Um, so for, on your USAC um, filing, was there, I didn't see an amount on this. I know Docomo received $270,000 in 2021. Do you know what your your um, the amount was that was that you guys were certified recently? I was submitted. Huh? I'm just yeah. looking at the uh, the order. 1.8 uh, for us. So I think Docomo got more than us. Uh, yeah. They spent like two hundred seventy thousand dollars in 2021. I think it was. Maybe that's a month or something. But, right. Uh, okay. They usually get a little. I mean, it's set it's set by the right. FCC or it, USAC. Is it just based on your volume or subscriber base, or is it uh, based on about five years ago they froze it based on a subscriber counts? Okay, that's how you. Yeah, yeah and so that was set by USAC and that just continued on for the since like the past five years. Right. Right. Okay. And you're you're expecting about one point eight this year? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Peter makes a motion. Is there a second? Pedro seconds. All in favor say aye. Aye. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Pereira. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chen. See you next year. No. <laughs> okay. Fred, do you want to do the next two uh, together or you want to separate them? I guess we could do them together. Do them together, okay. They're a little different on the five year plans. Right. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, come, I'll, I'll announce it first. GTA docket. 2201 petition of GTA for annual USAC certification. We have an ALJ report and a proposed uh, uh, USAC certification. And GTA docket 2202 petition of GTA Pulse Mobile for annual USAC certification. We have an ALJ report and a USAC certification. Fred. Thank you. So we'll cover GTA first. And of course, GTA provides uh, landline uh, phone services, among, among other things. And my comment here also applies to Pulse. Both companies, of course, have met the requirements of providing the nine required services. And both companies have provided certifications by uh, Andrew Gale, uh, which he's the chief operating officer for both companies. But he has certified that all of the funds received for USAC will be used only for the support of the required services. For uh, GTA and its, its five-year plan, uh, they have filed a plan, and as with the other companies, they've shown major network improvements for six calendar years, 2022 through 2027. 
and um, this will enhance their network and, as I mentioned, allow them to invest in new technology. Now, the interesting thing about their GTA's projects for the five years, 2022 through 2027, all of them are for expansion of fiber to the home. And that's completely different than last year. So last year, uh, they had provided for uh, a technology known as VDSL, which is very high data rate uh, digital subscriber line. And that was their entire proposal for the five years. So they have uh, basically pivoted to a newer technology. That's the fiber to the home. And I, I attached an article to the report, which if you want to know more about fiber to the home, uh, you, you can read in more detail. Basically, uh, that technology is the installation and use of optical fiber from a central point directly to individual buildings, such as residences, apartment buildings, businesses, and homes. And this is to provide high-speed internet service. The Fiber to the home dramatically increases connection speeds available to com uh, computer users compared with the technologies now in use. And experts are now considering it to be the best available technology. Uh, I think under the existing requirements, uh, companies have to provide something like 25 megabits uh, downstream. And, and now the technology will go up to 100 megabits. So it's really quite a fascinating technology, and uh, that is what GTA is proposing to do for, for the next five years. So I thought it was interesting. Each of the companies is moving to this fiber to the home, which should hopefully provide us when it's accomplished. And it'll take a number of years, but will provide us with better service. So let me also cover the five-year plan for uh, Pulse Mobile. Now, now Pulse Mobile is a mobile car uh, carrier, more, more like uh, it and &E and uh, Docomo. And uh, Pulse, although Pulse Mo Mobile is their trade name, they're still operating as Teleguam Holdings. So it's, it's all really still the same company. Likewise, again, as I indicated, Mr. Gale provided all of the, the necessary certifications. And I want to uh, just briefly cover the services that they're going to implement. I mentioned um, Pulse will have projects, again, and they're, they're focused and concentrated on the 5G. <clears throat> They're still, by the way, working on the uh, next generation 911 system. Uh, they have made a lot of progress. I believe they've had their uh, uh, bid go out, and I'm not quite sure where it is in the process of selection, but they have moved ahead with that in the last year. Uh, 5G high speed wireless deployments is something they've been working on in 2021, and uh, they're doing that particularly in the south. Uh, they're looking to expand their sites. For 2022, again, working on 5G RAM site coverage capacity expansion, uh, adding very high speed internet service. And for 2023, they plan projects including 5G standalone, or upgrade 5G site expansion, additional site uh, construction and upgrading uh, the 5G network. So there, likewise, both companies have met the required certifications for USAC, and they both indicated five-year plans that indicate the technology upgrades that they have made and further intention. Thank you, Brad. Any comments? I think you can make a motion and combine both of them together. Okay. Uh, I'll move to uh, approve uh, docket 2201 and 2202 uh, for Dark Holdings. 
Is there a second? Second. Joe seconds. All in favor say aye. Aye. The motion carries unanimously. Next item is PAG docket 2206, petition for PUC approval of the award to AM Insurance for the Port Authority of Guam's insurance coverage. We have an ALJ report and a proposed order. Joe Fett, I believe this is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This matter concerns PAG's request for PUC approval of its contract of insurance with AM Insurance. Just last month, uh, on August 19, PAG publicly announced its uh, invitation for bid in the Pacific Daily News, which sought sealed bids for insurance coverage for the port. After a bid opening, PAG's procurement personnel determined that the sole bidder, AM Insurance, was the most responsible and had the most responsive bid with the lowest bid at three million five hundred forty five thousand one hundred nineteen dollars and thirty cents so PAG specifically requests that PUC approve its contract award to AM AM for the following coverage up to fifty five million in blanket coverage for physical loss and damage to all real and personal property including earthquake flood typhoon tsunami loss of revenue business interruption uh, and even boiler or machinery breakdown at a cost of three million one hundred one thousand five hundred forty three dollars and nine cents which ensures about two hundred forty six million in port assets uh, the policies will also include fifty million in marine liability at a cost of three hundred twenty five thousand and seven hundred five dollars there is also commercial insurance coverage for its directors and officers of uh, $5 million at a cost of $69,747.60, up to $2 million in automobile coverage at a cost of $34,636.61, and up to $1 million in crime coverage at a cost of $13,487. And pursuant to the proposed contract, AM will provide this proposed coverage to PAG for five consecutive years with renewal of policies subject to the availability of uh, PAG funding. Earlier today, Mr. Chair, uh, PAG's Board of Directors approved PAG's contract award to AM Insurance for the coverage uh, indicated in the petition and issued resolution number 2022-18, which is attached to the uh, filings provided to you, which authorizes the amount of 3,545,119.30 for the cost of the initial annual premium. This commission has consistently determined that the purchase of insurance coverage safeguards PAG assets from risks such as natural disasters or catastrophic events like fires, as well as coverage for any liabilities resulting from PAG's operations. This commission has also consistently highlighted the importance of maintaining insurance since it benefits ratepayers with regard to the protection of uh, port assets, assisting with recovery efforts after natural disasters and other calamities. Significantly, too, the insurance coverage is essential to PAG's compliance with its bond covenants. As stated in Appendix D to 2008 Port Revenue Bond Indenture, the authority must maintain or cause to be maintained insurance on the port with responsible insurers in such amounts and against such risks as are usually maintained by prudent operators of ports similar and or similarly situated so long as the insurance is available to the authority on the open market from responsible insurers at reasonable cost. Therefore, uh, PAG must purchase and maintain insurance that is similarly situated and prudent for port operators. Otherwise, PAG would be in violation of its terms of its bond indenture 
And so for these reasons, Mr. Chair, I uh, recommended that the PC approve the contract for insurance with AM for coverage indicated in the port's petition and for an initial animal, annual premium cost of $3,545,119.30. Thank you, Chair. Rory, any comments? Nothing, Mr. Chair, other than that, that thank you for the proposed order and that the board did do its due diligence and when we procured for this, we actually made it so that the um, uh, insurance carrier can, uh, can provide all or, 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 individual, or go after individual components of all we need coverage. Uh, and so two expressed interests and one submitted a bid uh, and so we dealt with that um, one provider and it went through the entire process. Thanks, Ray. Any comments or questions from the commission? Just a quick one. Go ahead. Uh, um, Roy, on the uh, insurance, uh, this is on a, this is a, uh, three million is the annual premium rate. Right? And is this for exactly five years? Is there another option for five years after that? Or is it just five individual just years that you guys will decide? Just five years, the, up to, so it's, it's five years and every year will be based on market conditions. Uh, and we understand that if it goes above 10 percent, then we have to come back to the PC, which is what we've been doing consistently. But, so the, but the first five years is yeah, already part of this docket, okay. Okay. And then the um, the insurance premiums for the previous years, how are they comparable? Um, when we put this bid out, we uh, did the requisition for 3.3, and we came in at uh, 3.5, and so. About twenty thousand over than what we anticipated, but, but definitely we budgeted um, uh, this amount. Right. Okay. And is it for additional yeah. coverage? Well, we understand that the premiums are going up, going and up unfortunately there. they'll continue to go up because, as we understand it, um, the post-pandemic uh, COVID created an environment with the with the supply chain, with the cost of materials, with the inability to source them, bring them in. Uh, but I want to say that this uh, insurance provider has been providing uh, this insurance to the port for well over a decade. Right. Uh, and that um, she's, she and her team have proven uh, themselves to be uh, deeply committed uh, to, the, to the insurance that they provide for the port. And so the 3.5 is fixed for five years? It doesn't go up? No, it's going to be uh, five years, but every year will be based on uh, market You'll conditions. You'll negotiate so for the pricing now. I don't know if we can, we're in a position to negotiate, they submit the amount, they justify to us, and if it goes over the 10% uh, threshold, then we'd have to come back to get the PC for it. But we do squeeze uh, in insurance, uh, and they they generally, like the last time they came in within 9%, so we didn't have to come back to the PC. Right. Okay. Joe? You were protecting the it's coming at 3.3, but what is it? What is current year? What's the cost of current year? Um, I, think it's, I would say it's 3.3. I mean, basically, what we we carried over what the current um, amount is. That's why in our market survey, that's why the procurement team thought that it would come in at that amount. Seconds. All in favor say aye. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Rory. Thank you, Ford. Next is GWA docket 2209, petition for approval to reallocate a portion of GWA Series A bond proceeds. We have an ALJ report and a proposed order. Fred. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. So this matter comes before the Commission on the Petition of Guam Water Works Authority for PUC approval to reallocate a portion of GWA Series 2020A bond proceeds. The objective of the bond proceed reallocation is to allocate additional funding 
regarding the court ordered tank reservoirs project. GWA's management seeks to reallocate $30,425,000 of the 2020 A bond proceeds from projects that have either already been completed, can be deferred, or for which funds are not immediately needed. The PUC and GWA docket 20-03 did authorize GWA to issue the bonds in an amount not to exceed $134,400,000. And that's the series 2028 water and wastewater system revenue bonds. Now in that uh, docket attached to the order was a table of projects that were funded by the bond proceeds. And uh, that was attached to my report. Uh, by the way, the net proceeds were roughly $103.6 million. <clears throat> On that project list, it included descriptions and funding amounts for the projects for 2023, 20, uh, 2020, 2021, and 2022. And the one to which GWA is seeking to reallocate is PW09 dash 11 water system reservoirs 2005 improvements <clears throat> now originally about 25 million dollars was allocated uh, to that project but uh, as i'll point out the problem is that that's really not sufficient to complete those projects so what gwa now seeks to do is reallocate the additional Thirty million four hundred twenty-five thousand from the other projects to the water system reservoirs, two thousand five improvements. Uh, the total expenditure for the water tanks reservoirs project increases up to fifty-six million one hundred twenty-seven thousand five dollars. The Consolidated Commission on August twenty-third this year did approve this reallocation. <clears throat> now, now the reason this particular project, the tanks reservoirs, is so important is that it's a court-ordered project. So it's part of the district court order uh, issued in 2011, unlike a number of the other projects. This is a priority project, and it's been pointed out to me by Waterworks that it has to be completed, I believe, by uh, June of next year. So there's a time deadline that has to be done as opposed to a number of other projects which can be uh, paid for in a different different way. Now, GWA has completed a lot of the court ordered projects regarding the repair, rehabilitation, uh, relocation, or replacement of the uh, tanks and storage reservoirs, but there's still a smaller number of reservoirs that have to be replaced and rehabilitated. So clearly, because of the district court order, those are um, objectives that have to be accomplished as, as soon as possible. Costs went up for those projects. That's why the reallocation is done. And there are a number of factors relating to that. Uh, global supply chain issues, increased demand in the uh, const local construction market, other geopolitical impacts. So I think the commission has certainly noticed that in other dockets involving the board, that costs for all of these construction projects have increased considerably in recent years. I think there, uh, there has been a justification provided for the need for increased allocation to these court ordered projects. Uh, there were some other issues uh, that I addressed in my report. I'm not going to cover them much. There uh, is no, no need for a bond council opinion here because basically we're talking all about existing projects. There's no new project or no new uh, specification. Uh, I did have a concern, which I presented to GWA, is whether the delay of the other projects that the bond proceeds were allocated for would cause any uh, harm or delay, or, or yeah, harm basically to GWA or its ratepayers. And I was provided with a uh, 
a list of the projects and a very specific indication that there would be either no harm or minimal harm to all of the projects that are being deferred. And some of those will, will still be carried on, but funded by other means, such as grant funds, um, perhaps future uh, financing might, might be required for some of them. But uh, I think it's been demonstrated to my satisfaction that those projects can be delayed, whereas the court ordered project has to be done but it's really crucial that the funds be reallocated. So in sum, for those reasons, uh, I recommend that the commission approve the bond reallocation and I have prepared an order that will accomplish that. Thank you, Craig. Uh, any comments, Miguel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just wanted to point out, aside the general reasons that um, ALJ Horecki has provided, for the reason that for the cost increases, just to give you an example, when we started the tank, the new concrete tanks, we were paying between one and two dollars per gallon of storage. So a million gallon tank would cost us between 1.5 and two million dollars to construct. Based on the most recent estimates that we've had and most recent uh, bids that have come in for projects that are ongoing, uh, now we're looking at between five and eight dollars per gallon of storage. Uh, these three remaining tanks, new concrete tanks that are being constructed are two and three million gallon tanks, so they're larger than the initial batch batches that we've installed, and in some cases the, the uh, construction conditions are more challenging, with uh, one being constructed in uh, more volcanic soils, which has required us to um, use uh, more resources for the foundations of these tanks. And also, we anticipate that we are going to have some archaeological issues on one of the tank sites, at least. So that is another um, complicating factor. So if the cost has increased uh, just on the basis of what's happening in the world and, and in the local markets. And uh, we are doing our best to try to keep those down, but we do need to reallocate these to get the projects bid and completed. Thank you, Miguel. Any questions from the commissioner's door? we are augmenting existing tanks. So we will construct a new tank and then the existing reservoir will be inspected, assessed, and then repaired. So it's a combination of new and rehabilitation. Uh, right now I think we have about 28, uh, I'm sorry, 25 tanks uh, online and operating, but we have repairs ongoing to several more, I want to say between six and eight. Uh, existing so tanks are being currently being repaired. The, the fifty million dollars will cover the three new concrete storage tanks and then rehabilitation of several additional steel tanks down south that also need uh, to be done. So, uh, do the projects that are currently being constructed are in existence? They require uh, regular inspection and regular capital maintenance, but uh, they won't require annual rehabilitation. You know, the new concrete tanks we anticipate uh, will require less regular maintenance just because of the, the method of construction. Um, as an example, we put in one of the first tanks that we put in was a Barragata, the two Barragata tanks. Uh, we just took one down for just to do an inspection and it looked really good on the inside after you know, five, six years already. And we just had to do some minor touch-ups and, and uh, we put it back into service.
inspections, yes, will come from operating funds. The, the, any capital maintenance may come from internally funded CIP if we have uh, the revenues to support that. Otherwise, uh, we'll have to look for other funding sources of potentially uh, bonds or grants. I think for our current program of rehabilitation under the court order, we've not really had to postpone anything because we've been able to secure the funding that's required. Uh, moving forward, once we complete the court order requirements, I don't anticipate that we will have to defer uh, any maintenance on these tanks. I, I can tell you that um, the issues that we're facing now or have been facing over the past several years because of the pandemic and the cost containment measures that we have faced, we have had to defer maintenance, some capital maintenance on other facilities, but not the reservoir. And uh, have, this, have you already awarded or you're in, or we have not yet? We have not yet awarded. We, we need to have the funds certified before we can issue the procurements. We have the bid packages ready to go uh, for two of the three, the, uh, the third concrete tank, we had to modify the foundation design, which on the basis of experience that we're having in Santa Rita, because the availability of equipment, what we designed for, is no longer, the equipment is in demand because of military construction projects that it's not available to us, we have to change the design. Uh, so that one will be completed shortly and uh, probably within the next month, uh, that final design will, will be completed and then we can put it out to bid. We anticipate putting bids out next month for those two tank projects. It will take us about 30 to 45 days to get the bids back, and then probably another 30 to 45 days to get the contract. So within three months, we should have uh, construction start. Fred, do they come back before us when they have the award? No. Under the contract. Yeah. Order order projects that's Miguel, how many reservoirs have you guys constructed already? Uh, new concrete ones? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't have an exact number for you, but I, I do know that we, I'm going to say uh, probably between uh, 10 and 15. 10 to 15. If any commissioners want to crawl in and out of a brand new reservoir after it's constructed, I was able to do that one day, and that's quite an exciting little adventure. So you can contact Miguel. We, we have already a uh, suggestion staff has contacted your staff to try and get a survey going through when I could take you out to see some of these sites uh, next yeah. month. So please. Uh, yeah, the other thing that I really, I mentioned it before, but being able to see some of the new wastewater treatment plants in Northern, uh, Agate Santa Rita, and Pneumatic, that's well worth a visit too. Yeah. See what, see what you're signing off on all the time, though. Anything else? Pedro. Yes. Uh, this is the third uh, object, the section of them, the third one of the rocks. Are there four over? No. Mm. Yes. They're not four over. The deferred projects. A non pro order projects. Mm. Anything else? Will this complete what's required under the certain court order we're working on? This is the last item remaining under the court order. Once oh. we get these projects done, we're done with the court order. Okay. We'll have to have a party. Thank you. Okay. I'll be the bartender. Well, uh, on that note, I'd like to move to approve this order. Peter makes a motion to approve. Is there a second? A second. 
Rowena seconds. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Pedro, you're with us, right? All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Miguel. You. Teresa. <laughs> You've been through enough already. <laughs> Next item is GPA Doc at 2216, petition for extension of the term of the lease agreements for pipeline and RFO storage with TriStar terminals. We have an ALJ report and a proposed order. Joe Fed, I believe this one is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this matter concerns GPA's request to extend its contracts with TriStar Terminals Guam Inc. Related to GPA's use of TriStar's pipeline and residual fuel oil storage tanks for an additional three years. As this commission may be aware, TriStar is the current manager of the port's F1 dock, where TriStar assists GPA with loading and unloading fuel from GPA's fuel vessels. Pursuant to a certain existing pipeline agreement between GPA and TriStar, GPA has a continuing non-exclusive right to cause its oil and other petroleum products to be transported through pipeline B, which is a pipeline uh, owned by TriStar, from the F1 dock to the Navy valve pit for connection to the pipeline to GPA's Cabra storage and power generating facilities. In addition, pursuant to a 2018 amendment, the parties negotiated a $566,350 annual usage fee for this pipeline for the period of September 2021 through August of 2022. In addition, the second contract is an RFO storage lease agreement, uh, which was entered between TriStar and GPA, where TriStar has agreed to provide GPA with storage tanks for storing fuel oil, which TriStar maintains and operates. And pursuant to a 2018 amendment to the RFO storage lease agreement, the parties have agreed to a $1,933,820 annual storage fee, which comes out to about $161,000 monthly for the period of September 2021 through August of 2022. According to GPA, it has negotiated extensions of both the pipeline agreement as well as the RFO storage lease agreement with TriStar for an additional three years and according to GPA, the fees under the extended pipeline agreement will remain the same at the prevailing rate of $47,195.86 per month. Uh, similarly, its fees under the extended RFO storage lease agreement would also remain the same, as I mentioned, which is about $1.9 million per year. However, according to GPA, this annual lease fee is anticipated to be reduced to about 1.8 million for the first year of the extension based on a reduced storage capacity and then further reduced to 1.2 million for the second and third years of the three-year extension based again on a reduced storage capacity owing to GPA's uh, transition to 0.2% ultra low sulfur fuel oil. So based on this documentation, Mr. Chairman, I, I determined that uh, these contracts are also reasonable and necessary and that the extensions requested by GPA are prudent. They're vital since they ensure the uninterrupted supply of fuel to GPA's uh, power generating facilities. And as this commission has previously held, any disruption to the safe distribution of fuel resources to GPA could be a potential threat to the public health, welfare, and safety of our island. And as I mentioned, uh, the pipeline agreement fees will remain the same, which was the same fee that was negotiated back in 2018, 
and will not cost the ratepayers any more than what is already being paid under this contract. In addition, the fees under the RFO storage lease agreement will also remain the same and may lessen according to GPA based on the reduction of lease storage during the three year period. So accordingly, based on a review of the extension of these contracts, uh, there is a potential for savings for the ratepayers as the fees appear to lessen uh, during the duration of the three year extension. And so based on this record, Mr. Chair, I recommended that the PUC approve the requested extensions petitioned by GPA. Thank you, Joe Pat. John, any comments? This is some Mr. Chair. Uh, the uh, BD-809 is now burning out uh, ultra low sulfur diesel, both units, so we're not burning any more RFO. The second point is that we have to be at the end of the year uh, at 0.2% sulfur. So we have been burning out all the high sulfur, the 1.19% sulfur, and recently brought in 0.2% uh, sulfur as the initial uh, uh, volume. So, as you can see from the program, the cost is going to be coming down over the next two or three years. And that's because we don't now need all that tankage up in TriStar. The only tankage that we need today from TriStar, other than the one we're using now, the diesel, but the only tankage for RFO, uh, is the one to hold the 0.2% sulfur. Uh, for the cabbers that want to do until his retirement date. That's why we're, we're, we're going to be letting go some of the tankets. But we have to take all that oil out and send it to cabbers and burn it all out uh, as part of the scheme. And we wanted to use the, we have two tanks, and we wanted to use one of them for the 0.2%. But if you recall, uh, we have to have some work done on the first tank. Uh, plates have to be placed and all of that, and that won't be completed until the end of the year. So at the end of the year, that will be completed, and we will start storing ultra low dark, uh, sulfur diesel uh, fuel, the one that we use at the Ukudu power plant, and will be used also at PD. The second tank now will have to be taken out of service. And that has 1.19% sulfur, which they're, they're, they're draining. Right? So that will have to be taken out of service and rehabilitated, which will take a, a year. And after that's done, again, that will be the ultra low sulfur diesel storage. So this is part of the transitioning of fuel uh, for this whole process. For, so we also are near the end of the line uh, with Cabras, uh, with Okudo coming on the line around. Uh, Summer of 2024, uh, we'll begin to transition away from, uh, we'll burn out all the heavy fuel, reduce tankets, and all we're left is our two storage tanks uh, down, uh, down at Cabos and the new plant. So, as far as the pipeline, at least the price didn't go up due to inflationary matters. I think that pipeline itself will take care, will take care of itself down the road because already now, uh, we are reducing our annual import of oil uh, from Kep using Kepco. Kepco is reducing our, our, our volume into the island of about 250,000 barrels. So if the true food on the island now is less. When we get Okudu on the line, the true food again will be reduced by 500,000 barrels. So that's how much oil we don't have to pay to come through the pipeline. And then uh, I think that we'll be petitioning the PUC for about 120, 180 megawatts of new renewables to, to scale to be on the line by 2026. So that'll be coming, the CC approved that uh, last night and will be coming to your uh, petition of open. That will again drop another 500,000 barrels of triple. So I think that the whole, the whole plan here now is that the, in, the import of oil will be have already been reduced about a uh, quarter a million barrels, 250,000. When the Okudu plant comes in, there's another 500,000 barrels. And that in itself will already reduce our total import by 2024 
by 30%. Into the new renewables, we can reduce our total imports of oil by 50% by 2026. So less and less in, uh, input, total fare. They may want to increase the rate now. The, the, the throughput now will take care of the rates to maintain the power plant, maintain, maintain the power uh, pipeline, and maintain the pier. You know, so that's a real cost to the port and others. So we may have to negotiate that rate. But the, the, the end, the end result is that the rate payers are going to see savings also there as a result of reduction in uh, throughput. So that's my. That's all I wanted to say. So we're almost there in the in the big challenge of going from three field to five field to one field. So we're getting there. We're two 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 and a half years away. And now we're down to, uh, now I can say by the end of the year we'll be down to two fields. And can we burn low sulfur diesel until the end of its life cycle, the 1.19%? It, yeah, it's a 0.2% not ultra low sulfur diesel. It's a ultra low sulfur yeah. RFO. Okay. It's still a heavy oil because yeah. it can burn the diesel or the waste. But uh, yeah, and by the end of the year, that's all we'll be burning. So we'll be complying with uh, our US EPA. Mm -hmm. Now complying with we met the requirement for PDA. And I remember, despite the cabers one and two issue that delayed us, uh, we were able to make that happen. And now the last one is the 22 percent. So and then so the prices you're seeing from here is really the top end. Now we're burning all the expensive fuel and now the next quest is to get the power plant done and see the huge savings that will result from from the, the efficiency of the new plan. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. So, Any George, you have a comment? Maybe uh, the 
maybe uh, 50 megawatt on, on land lease from uh, a no cost from the Navy. That went through a two year process. We won the case to the OPA, we went to the Superior Court, we won the case. But then, because of all the world events and everything, the contractor could not recently con uh, continue the contract. And they, and they didn't want to offer us a price because the, the world pricing is blocks. <coughs> They're not sure whether the supply chain will be available for them to meet a schedule. So they bought out also on that. So there's two projects now that we contracted or, or almost contracted the one and contracted the other that's not going to happen. At least my, from my uh, opinion at this time. So that's why you're seeing before you, you'll be seeing before you our request for 180 megawatts. So that they will be now instead of 2025 meeting all those goals, it'll be at 2026 and bring us to somewhere in the neighborhood of about 40% 40, 40 renewables by 2026. And uh, the contract you can see before you is similar to the past. There still has to be transmission put in. But again, it's a little bigger, so that maybe the bigger the land area, the bigger the contract, uh, reduces the cost, uh, this cost for transmission and other things. So that we can still get, get a good reasonable price for uh, the renewable. So that'll be coming before uh, the commission. And again, we're adjusting to those two contracts with this and with our objective to again head towards 50% renewables by 2050. So what we we'll have before you uh, next week is ready to bring us to uh, 40, 40 to 44 percent by then. One more question related to that, John, because I do remember, you know, the protest also happened when I was the public auditor. So the second co company that may not, <coughs> the rates were so low, I, you know, like, I think eight cents per kilowatt or something like that. The other contractor was slightly more. Well, the, uh, the tempo is 8.5 and the, uh, um, and the, uh, it ended up that the uh, uh, Hanwha was uh, about 8.2, 8.2, so they're about the same. Oh, okay. I, I thought one was a little, a little bit higher. So, who is the contractor that is likely not going to go to? Uh, Han Hanwha. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank this you. All the way from Dandan, they have to operate the transmission and everything. In. And so we tried to work out other alternatives, but at the end, uh, I don't I don't see it, uh, a benefit uh, or the it's all to the negative of the, of the rate here. And then I don't want to start uh, a precedent that we can I cannot uh, support in terms of uh, having a best interest of the rate here. So I'm going to leave it at that. They can decide to move forward, but right now in their best interest, maybe they'll just admit that they cannot do it and. And let's move forward, and we're going to move forward with the new Thank you, John. Anything else? Yeah, just a quick comment. Uh, uh, you know, John, we've been working on this uh, uh, for the last 10 years, and we've been working with TriStar. And so uh, I just want to congratulate you guys for negotiating the contract, keeping the price the same, because they've been notorious for bringing it up since they have a monopoly on the storage tank. So thank you for doing that. Um, and then uh, on the second part is once the, after the three years and when the, uh, when the new power plant goes online, it's my understanding that um, we'll have our own storage tanks at that point, correct? And so will there, be, will there be a continuing need to do business with TriStar after the new plant goes well, up? This, this, is a, uh, this is a question that we uh, again, we don't have to answer today, but we're, uh, we're always looking about reliability, sustainability, and everything, right? So the first answer is uh, with the two storage stand that we have, and uh, remember the Okuro is going to hold uh, one month supply at three yeah, days. Yeah, so that will uh, keep the island running uh, for one month in case we had a tsunami that pushed the tanks or whatever, no? So the question is, you know, what is there any catastrophe that would uh, make it uh, 
would, would not allow us to get back within one month uh, during the time. So, uh, so then that begs the question maybe that we may look at whether we just, uh, what you call it, lease one additional tank or try to buy it from price stock or which is up in higher ground. So that would be our other stories. No? So if anything ever happened, and the tank farm is destroyed in terms of for whatever reason uh, God will know, right? Then you still have the pipeline connection. So all you have to do is change the, the pumps uh, that will probably be, you know, all wet and everything. Change the pumps and use this as a additional storage of the way. So but right now, again, the plan is really to add, at the end of this, we won't need price store and all that. But again, I'd be remiss if I don't say, you know me, I'm always thinking, I always try to think ahead as to, as, as my, I, my mind cannot let it go, so that's why I mentioned it. But again, that's that's the plan. We won't need, the, that'll be 536,000 barrels plus another, well, six, we have about 700,000 barrels of storage. So that's like almost four to six months of supply. And we can report those two things. Thank you. Thank you. Did All in favor say aye. Motion carries unanimously. <coughs> GPA docket 2217, petition extension of dock facility agreement with TriStar Terminals. We have an ALJ report and a proposed order. Joe Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This docket is uh, related to the last uh, last two contracts that we were just discussing, and it concerns GPA's extension uh, of its contract with TriStar as it relates to the handling and receipt of fuel oil imported at the F1 fuel pier facility. As this commission is aware, the F1 fuel pier facility is the dock located on Cabras Island that is owned by the port where petroleum products and non-petroleum products are offloaded and discharged. Uh, TriStar currently manages the F1 dock for PAG and since 2013 GP has contracted with TriStar to discharge or load fuel from and to GK vessels by providing GP with equipment and labor necessary for the transfer of this fuel. According to GPA, it has negotiated an extension of the dock facility contract through March 31st, 2026, and with the same rates, which include the hourly rates for the dock operators, excess lead time costs, and import and export fees per barrel of um, RFO. As noted in the report, these fees have not changed since 2013 and GPA submits that the annual cost for the management fee is about $1,924,512 for an estimated total of $5,773,536 for the additional three years. Based on the documentation that I reviewed, I found the contract to be reasonable and necessary and that the extension of this dock facility contract is prudent in as much as the operations that occur on the F1 dock are crucial to GPA's operations. Uh, the reports filed in previous dockets have indicated that it is evident that if GPA were under the user agreement, it would not have the necessary dock facility at which vessels commissioned by GPA could load and unload fuel oil. And so that without the use of the F1 dock facility, GPA would be unable to obtain the fuel necessary to supply its power plants, and without this fuel, GPA could not provide electricity to its ratepayers. 
In addition, the extension of the contract means that the fees for the services provided under this dock facility contract will remain the same for the next three years. And as noted in the report, these fees have remained the same since 2013. And so I recommended that the PDC approve the three-year extension for this particular TriStar uh, 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 contract. Thank you, Joe Fett. John, any comments on this? No, Mr. Chair, just Good. Me, there's no other way around it. We don't want to get into the business of getting into the box and all of that. So, um, any uh, comments from the commissioners? Is there a motion? of the cost, uh, GPA indicates that the, the cost, uh, which will increase from about $911,000 up to $1,118,000, uh, is reasonable. And uh, various factors have been cited by IP&E and its managing director, Brian Bamba. Again, it's kind of the increases in the cost of operations that all the utilities have been going through, and the operator, IPME, also indicates that all the services, terminal staff, security, contractors, et cetera, have all <coughs> increased in price. So based on that, the, uh, the increase involved is, is certainly understandable and appears to be reasonable. Um, 
as I mentioned before, you, you've seen that happen uh, today with uh, projects of waterworks and the bond reallocation and former projects such as Hotel Wharf and the Port Authority. The one, one kind of issue here is actually that the, the contract will terminate on September 30, and there's not a specific provision for extending it further. Now, the PUC has confronted this situation in a number of dockets, which I've uh, gone over in my report. Uh, there was the uh, Marianas Energy Corporation situation where in 2018 you approved a five-year extension, although technically the, uh, the contract was terminated. And the extension was based on the broad amendment powers under the contract. <coughs> And in that case, of course, it was found the extension was necessary. Also, you similarly extended the fuel contract with high end dive for three months on the grounds that uh, even though there was no specific provision for a further extension, that it was justified to uh, provide an adequate transition to the fuel supplier. And even more recently, in the Graphics Center uh, case involving GPA and its billing services and continuing there, uh, basically the contract had expired, it was a protest, and there was no other solution other than to extend the uh, contract of, of Graphics Center. So that's really the same situation here. Uh, GPA did issue a new bid months ago, and earlier in this year, but the problem was the, the bidders were not compliant. There were certain affidavits that weren't properly supplied. So again, in June this year, GPA has gone out for uh, a, a bid for the operator of the uh, fuel storage facility. But that, that has not been awarded <coughs> yet, and uh, the timing is all very problematic. So I think for that reason, GPA decided to uh, extend with the current operator, IP&E. Uh, based on the prior precedent, uh, I think it's uh, permissible for them to do that. And they pointed out that uh, there's really a ground of necessity here because if they don't extend the contract, there's no operator. And this facility is very <laughs> crucial to GPA's operations. So. I concur that under the circumstances, this uh, one-year extension should be approved. But based on the record, I recommend that you do approve the one-year extension, and the GPA should be authorized to expend up to the amount of $1.118 million. <coughs> Thank you, Fred. John, any comment? Uh, just a quick comment, Mr. Chair. Uh, as we all know, we're trying from the spike field to T field density. <coughs> so it is a complicated process moving all of this fuel around and that might be an We did try earlier to come up with somebody so that we have adequate time for uh, mobilization, demobilization uh, of this process. Yeah? And, and again, uh, like the ALJ had mentioned, uh, that didn't come true because no fault of ourselves, but fault the bidders not complying with the requirements of Alpha Davis and all of that for some reason or that. If we can't take the risk, we need the continuity of the, of the facility because it's, it's more than just operating a valve and all of that. It also includes uh, spill prevention and control con countermeasures. Because uh, oil leak, they join the team, then they have to do all the action necessary to contain the, the leak and all of these different things. But again, I don't want to take over the facility uh, and not to train people to make this happen. The, the risk is too high. So again, uh, like the friend mentioned, uh, we have enough complications in our life right now. We need this one year extension. We will go out for a bit and have adequate time for the transitioning of one operator to another. And if you go every five years, it seems like there may have been a separate operator with Shell, IPLE, and so on and so on. So that's, that's why our request is there. Thank you, John. Any questions from the commissioners, Doris? So you did 
So the, the next contract will be up to um, put, uh, what's the name, got rank and correct if I'm wrong. But the next contract is up for expiration very shortly here. We're doing for one year. So again, maybe within three, three months to four months, we will start the process again. So that we have adequate time for the transitioning of, uh, there is a new low bidder for transitioning uh, of the process uh, to them. So, but right now, we started in June, there's one, and, and this is not enough time to transition, and we don't, we can't take it, it's, it's too high a risk, it's, we have an oil spill, that's huge, so money, insurance issues, all kinds of risks. Yeah. So my, my question though is, when you go out for bid, uh, how long It most likely be a, a three-year, uh, three-year option, just that we have in the, in the past to try and again that way whatever investments they made they take it over time so so we can try and get the price on that. And we don't want a revolving door, if you will, when it's such a critical uh, 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 operation of a facility. Thank you. Point of clarification, uh, what is the uh, uh, difference? I mean, we, we have this lease agreement with uh, um, with TriStar for storage. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we have a lease agreement for the to use their storage tanks. So it is, and then this is an agreement with IPE to manage it. No, to we'll operate and maintain the GPA storage tanks right. and the pumping system. So this is and help manage. So IPE uh, doesn't uh, touch the TriStar stuff. No. Okay. This is uh, it's it's manage the tanks. the flow uh, as necessary uh, okay. to this. And is this uh, management type contract will continue on even after the new plan is operating? Yeah. That, that's good. Okay. This is maybe this is just this is the only con the it's well, it's the one contract. The other contract will be now the uh, the fuel pipeline from the dock, and right. then the third one is the dock. So that's the last three contracts you see uh, moving forward. Second. Second. Peter seconds. All in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries unanimously. Next item. GPA docket 2219. Petition to approve contract with Temis for Macheche CT repairs. We have an ALJ report and a proposed order. Fred? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Turn on here. Um, yes, this is the uh, petition for approval of uh, the contract repairs for the Macheche CT. GPA seeks to replace the Macheche turbine package with a fully refurbished gas turbine. The turbine replacement and repairs will cost three million nine hundred fifty-three thousand four hundred seventeen dollars and sixty cents using uh, revenue funds. Uh, Temis, the PMC, has recommended, uh, first of all, it's been the PMC since 2016 for the Machete CT. It's recommended that GPA replace the turbine package with a fully refurbished gas turbine to prevent catastrophic failure caused by existing operations over the maximum runtime. And I would also add that the manufacturer, GE, has also uh, recommended that the uh, turbine be replaced. It's a, a 22 megawatt uh, power plant, has a GELM 2500 combustion turbine generator. That's been operating now, I think up to about 27,000 hours since 2016. And that exceeds the recommended service life of 25,000 hours. Right now, the unit is available, but limited to operation and only emergency use. 
Chemist had issued the request for bids here because it is the uh, PMC for the, the Machete CT is the one that operates it and basically for contracts, Chemist goes out for the bid. Uh, under the PMC contract, the GPA reimburse the cost for performance improvement projects or capital improvement projects. Chemist did issue a bid here. Three bids were received and gas turbine investments was the low bidder at the price I've mentioned, uh, over 3.9. Million. The GPA is looking to uh, minimize the downtime of, downtime of the unit and complete the work and return it to service. Hopefully the machine will be delivered within 100 days and then installation over three weeks. The Consolidated Commission in uh, Resolution FY 2022-28 did approve the uh, implementation and completion of the gas turbine exchange. So looking at it, uh, I asked GPA to provide me with information showing how much do you use the Machete CT? And it turns out that of the CTs, it, it's uh, fairly heavily utilized. Uh, since 2016, as I mentioned, the runtime has been over 27,000 hours. And this year, particularly, it seemed that uh, GPA relied on the Machete CT even to a greater extent because of the periods during which the Capris plants were down. And looking at the months from February through May of this year, totals per month for hours ranged from 279 up to 693 hours. Now, to me, of course, Plant management and operation is something that's usually up to GPA. They make those determinations. Here, the need for the Machete plant and the fact that both uh, GE and uh, Temis, the operator, that, that this engine be replaced is, is convincing to me. GPA hires Temis to manage the plant, and the man manufacturer indicated that there's a safety gain. There's apparently some uh, investigations that have done about uh, some of the equipment and uh, there's been damage. Uh, there was a boroscope inspection. I think there's an issue about the blades and damage to the turbine. So all of the parties involved are, are indicating that the plant should be, that the, the store, the uh, unit, the, the generation unit should be replaced. And the damages uh, indicate that there are safety reasons and avoidance of a catastrophic failure for, for replacing the CT. Again, the uh, life of the CT has been extended. I attached the contract, uh, mostly if you want additional information about the details of it that uh, was attached to the report. Uh, I did note, and I, I remembered when I first looked at this project, that the uh, turbine had been replaced in 2016. So that brought up the issue in my mind, well, you know, it's been six years, is that typical for, for the use of such a uh, turbine that you have to replace it every six years? I think it's based on the uh, runtime and the usage, so it's been heavily uh, used. Uh, the Assistant General Manager of uh, Operations, Ms. Mothmas, responded. She gave her opinion that uh, it, it does occur and it can be in a normal, that the gas turbine would have to be replaced after that much uh, general usage. Again, I'm not uh, an engineer, but uh, I, I rely upon the recommendations of Ms. Mothmas and uh, GE and so based on the opinion of all the parties, GPA, chemists, the manufacturer, and with Ms. Mothmas' opinion, I, I feel that uh, management has to be the one here to decide whether the CT should be replaced or not, and that they have made a, a compelling case 
both because of usage and the safety reasons to to replace the CT. So I'm recommending that the commission approve the uh, replacement of the existing existing turbine package with the fully refurbished gas turbine, and that GPA be authorized to expand up to the amount of 3.953 plus million for that replacement. Thank you, Fred. Any comments, John? Uh, we're currently, Mr. Chair, uh, the mature CNG group CT are the more efficient CTs in the system, and they're going to be around as reserve units for old to do when they're time to do all the hours. No? 25,000 hours is the recommended life for overhaul, or what this replacement is, is really there's a zero machine that's been overhauled, and you bring it in and just replace it. You don't run the risk of overhauling these things here in the island, you don't have the part, something happened, and then you're down for a long time. So it's been standard practice for us and uh, in the industry in a lot of cases to go ahead and just have Jigo machines. And just like Jigo, remember we lost Jigo uh, and then we bought that $5 million one and just put it right in. So the same thing uh, with Jigo, they would adjust it. We've been running it since uh, Cabbage 3 and 4 has been down. It's when about 2016, you know? Averaging 4,000 or more, four to 5,000 hours a year, so that's in five years, that's 25,000 hours. We still need the machine, uh, we're heavily dependent upon it for the next two years until Ukudu is on the line. So if we take Ukudu on the line in two years, that's 4,000, that's 8,000, 10,000 hours, still have the life of the machine after the new power plant comes on the line. Then it will be relegated to reserve. Therefore, you probably use it 100 hours a year, hopefully, by Okudo just burn alone. So therefore, I don't see the machine having to be replaced again after that, or overhaul. No? So this is as part of the regular maintenance to achieve this. It has operated, it has maintained uh, for the past uh, five years, and then when we determine when what we have to do, we use a boroscope that goes inside, like you know, and it takes a look at the plates and everything and the condition. So there are some you know, things where it come through the turbine that broke some things, and, and it's not in the best of health uh, at this point. So uh, it's time to really adjure uh, it. And then secondly, that's why we're only leaving it as emergency. I think we'll be fine. I think we'll make it through. Uh, until we can get it replaced, but again, we put in that extra precaution. This is why, uh, and again, the other bits were like five million, I believe, uh, five or six million dollars uh, versus this three point. Thank you, John. Any questions from the commissioners? Doris? John, you said that uh, once Okudu is is up and running, you won't need the chest you as much as what you're using mm -hmm. now. That's great. But let me just ask this. Okudu itself, right, will need to come down periodically for maintenance or up for what? Uh, yeah, that's great. That's great. And so what are your reserves? So um, at least I remember in progress it was, what, 60 units, you know, 60 units. Yeah. So when Okudu comes down, how many, uh, how many do you have there, and how many can you take down at a time? We're still going to be needing uh, uh, approximately close to 200, uh, because once every four years, the turbine goes down. So there's two ways, we're still working that out. We're going to have, we'll have the reserve, we're, we're going to keep the combustion turbines, because they're low cost to operate and maintain, and, uh, and especially this is going to use it very seldom versus the the uh, diesel unit. So right now I'm thinking maybe the tenzo units and everything will be retired versus the combustion turbine. So we're still working. We're going to have to have enough to correct reserves to to uh, make sure that once every four years the turbine is taken down at Okudu for overall, just like we're doing in Capris. This is a steam steam turbine uh, scenario. Every, us it was every five years here and there every four years so that's going to continue so we'll make sure we have that reserve with low cost reserve and the fact that we were having we're going to have more energy storage batteries shifting 
So let's evaluate how much of that will be uh, the value on the research process, and maybe we can retire more reserves from there. But again, uh, that's the process we're going through. But yes, you need the reserves even after OPD comes under money. You're going to save a lot of money because of operating costs, but you're still going to have to have a reserve to maintain the liability, you know? Because everything is renewable, so everything is renewable, so you're going to have the energy uh, to be there. But having a battery lessens the peak, lessens the peak, lessens the, the amount of reserves you have to require. So, so that's what we would be doing now. So when you said that Okudu will be, have to go down every four years, is that based on time or is that based on usage like the way Machete was? It's, ba it's basically uh, based on uh, usage also. And, uh, but again, Okudu is going to be our base, so it's going to be running uh, every day, every day for the next four years once it's on the line. And then for that 30 day period, that's going to be off the line. I mean, we still have the combustion turbines as necessary. But the combustion turbines with all the heat recovery and, and the pollution, uh, the uh, emission control system drives our emissions up and therefore limits the amount of time that we can operate the machines in a one year period. So that's why we will have the reserves to operate and maintain the units so that it can continue to save us money on the line. You know? So do you have the reserves now or is that reserves will have to be built we in? We don't have much reserves now, but the reserves that we but the units that we have today uh, will be the reserves for the future. So the only one that we were working on is the forty one megawatt, but unfortunately that one the price went up substantially. So I'm still working on that issue whether we're gonna move forward on it. Or do we just add more batteries? Or, or just, so we're, we're still coming up with a plan with that. But other than that, that's the last of the Mohegan City Road that we're going to build on a conventional unit. We're going to keep the additional ones at 30 some years old and continue to operate and maintain, especially on a limited basis. Not, not the way it is today, on a regular basis for years to come, no, no way. But uh, for the short term and as we serve, uh, we should be fine. Any, anyone else? Is there a motion? GPA docket 2220, petition to approve bond refinancing savings for capital loose, lease and O&M expense of the Ukadu power project. We have an ALJ report and a proposed order. Fred? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, commissioners. So you'll recall that in March of this year, in GPA docket 2210, the PSA approved GPA's refunding 2012 Series A revenue bonds. That was called the 2022 Series A revenue refunding bonds. And those bonds were delivered in July of this year. And uh, I included in the report a summary of the savings. And I think for the purpose of, of savings, the important uh, part is the annual uh, average cash flow savings 2024 to 2030. And that works out to be 10 million plus per year. And then from 2031 to 2034, uh, 4.2 million a year. So the question is, how are those savings going to be used by GPA? Uh, in its order in March, the GPA would file a petition to the PUC indicate how the actual savings would be allocated. And also in the 
public law that uh, approved the bond refinancing, public law 3680, the legislature had stated that savings and annual debt service payments from refunding shall be utilized specifically for the direct benefit of the rate payers. And uh, the legislature indicated in the law that within 90 days of the completion of the refinancing, GPA and the Public Utilities Commission will notify the legislature of the intent and plan regarding the annual debt service payment savings. The CCU applied the or, I'm sorry, approved the current petition of GPA in resolution FY 2022-29 and uh, approved the allocation of the savings towards what they call the capital lease and operating and maintenance, maintenance expense of the Ukudu Power Project. Now the capital lease is really the annual cost that GPA has to pay for the uh, operations of of the plant. Uh, looking at the the expenses for the plant, and uh, GPA CFO John Kim supplied me with detailed information about that. Uh, without going into too much detail, which I've included in my report, it's, it's roughly about uh, seventy million dollars a year. And then if if you know, you, you look at the cash flow savings, um, to the best that I could for the entire period, I came up with a, a total figure of $87.2 million in cash flow savings. Now, that pales a little bit about the from the total expenses for the plant from uh, 2024 through 2034, which would be roughly $735 million. So, even if the savings are applied, it'll only cover a small amount of the cost of the Ukudu plant. But since that is a major expense of GPA, uh, it is helpful certainly to the ratepayers that at least some of the expense will be borne by these savings. So it would seem that the savings will help to minimize the burden on the ratepayers from the cost of the Ukudu plant. And they are being utilized for the benefit of ratepayers by reducing the cost of ratepayers. So as you know, um, GPA has been coming up with various means of, of getting savings for the ratepayers to reduce the rate impact in upcoming years. This bond uh, reallocation is one of them, and there have been some others proposed too. Um, this was basically done with savings earlier too, and that's in docket uh, 1811 with regard to the savings from the 2010 GPA bond refinancing. The same petition came before the PUC as to the savings, which were nearly $10 million a year in that case. And similarly as here, GPA sought to apply the bulk of those savings to the uh, debt service on the, the new Ukudu power plant. Now there were some other uh, allocations there, more minor allocations, but the main allocation again was to the Ukudu power plant. So in accordance with the reasoning of that prior document, it seems to me that GPA's proposal to utilize the savings for the uh, operation expense and, and O&M expenses of the Ukudu power project is for the benefit of the ratepayers. It meets the legislative test that was established. Based on that, I've recommended that the PUC approve GPA's use of bond refinancing savings for the uh, capital lease and O&M expense of the plant, and I've prepared an appropriate order to that effect. Thank you, Fred. John? Um, Mr. Chair, the, the commission has asked us in the beginning about the, how we're gonna pay for the power plant. And so we have noticed since the very beginning that we were looking at refinancing as one way. And refinancing, we, have hope, we were hoping to get $15 million. Unfortunately, the delays have caused that, so now we end up, we did end up with 10 when the market was already starting to go up. You know? 
So that's 10 million lens. And uh, again, we're talking about the base rate or portion of the of the operation because Okudu, Okudu is paid from the base rate portion. The fuel savings is coming from the LIA. So recall there is even was a promise that we will not we will try not to increase the base rate. And part of it is by refinancing, retirement of capers one and two, reduce labor, reduce fuel uh, tankage costs. All of that is the savings that we're looking to try and not move the, the base rate to accommodate the 70 million annual uh, cap, uh, capacity fee and o &M fee. But again, as you recall, the net savings from the fuel more than offset the cost for the new power plant. So therefore, uh, this is just one of those efforts, uh, Mr. Chair. And so if you look at the refinancing scheme, we did not take any money, we didn't request to get any of that cash. All of that was to begin, the debt service savings was to begin in 2024 when the new capacity uh, comes on the line. And that's the way it's been, it was set up. So that there's no savings today, whatever is really to begin when the new capacity comes on the line. And the few savings come. So all of that together will result in substantial savings to the rate payers. So. Thank you, John. Any questions from the commission, Doris?
it's all part of the plan and, and uh, we're trying to make sure we we're trying to see how we can swing it before uh, moving the base load at the base rate but again it's always been understood that the whole project is resulting in savings for the workers. So just to be clear again, John, for my mind, okay, the seven
So maybe you know uh, we have to manage expectations uh, and stuff. And and again, uh, I, I just pray that again it continues to come down. The more it comes down, the faster we can recover, right? However, like it did come down, I I usually watch WTI it's relatively close to say. So yeah, it went uh, from 80 some down to 76. Remember that was up to 120, and now uh, today it went up again to 83. So I'm just hoping that the trend continues and hold it over the next month or so, and uh, again we can at least uh, uh, maintain it. Uh, and you know, you know us, I mean, we're good, then okay, fine, but I mean, we're, uh, we have to recognize that the under recovery is still huge. And maybe this is an opportunity that at least will bring us into February under a report having to raise the, the rate. Uh, I think we're going to go up a few more minutes in, in November. So again, I know that decision is for the, before the PUC uh, in October, I believe. So that's just the latest I am, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I think your placeholder number originally that you presented to us is 34. So we'll see. We'll see how the next few weeks go, and we'll take a look at things, and we'll go from there. I think so, Mr. Chair. This is how to manage expectations, because we're not like the gas stations, you know, up right. and down, and all of that, and, uh, and so yeah. forth. Yep. Thank you, John. Thank you, GPA. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. It's been a long night, but uh, thank you for all your efforts. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you. Yes, it has. Back to back Thursdays. Okay, next item is administrative matters, and first item is notification by commissioners regarding meeting attendance. Is Ted, are you handling this, Fred? Okay. So, uh, only a request to the commissioners if you know in any particular month that you won't be available for the meeting, please notify staff. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, requesting that you um, um, notify us if you know that you won't be at the meeting. Okay, thank you. I think that comment was not not for me, uh, and I do apologize, but I do recall telling the chairman. That's my it's my problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm very unreliable. It's the problem is the chairman is not always thinking about telling the others, so yeah. so so I, we didn't know but that. I but know that that's but it wasn't just you. I, we had some late notifications. Yeah, there were there were four of us off island at the same time. So just just to keep I us advised. Yeah. yeah. So forget the chairman and yeah. notify staff. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> don't bother to tell me. Exactly. Because I thought it was as a courtesy to the chair. Right. And I thought well, I Thank you. Yeah, the staff, so. Okay, uh, next item, PUC email communications and other correspondence. Fred? So so this was brought up by um, uh, Commissioner Montanola. Maybe, maybe you'd like to uh, address yeah, you. your intent. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. So that, um, recently, I think uh, Colleen had sent out a couple of emails warning of some spoof and some spams and some viruses that were attached to her name. As a matter of fact, they got really clever, and I received a second one last night, or two nights ago, that was actually my response to you, and they copied all that body, and then set, sent me uh, a link for, here are the documents that you need to open and, and sign, right? And here's, here's the password. And so I already knew this. All I did was look at who it was from, it was from me to me, right? And then from, and then my email, uh, my name was a different email address that I didn't so I ended up deleting. So my recommendation was to get the PC emails uh, online in case um, uh, I think I don't know if, if they're if the existing because we're all using all our personal emails yeah. right now. So we wanted we discussed this before about trying to get a PC email address, uh, an official PC address, so that even when we're responding and any correspondence back and forth. 
is uh, is is company business at that at that point, or commission business at that point. Um, so that was the reason for trying to make just trying to like move forward with getting our company our commission emails set up. So uh, and and I think we can use it through Ideal. They're the ones who are just handling our IT and our, and our sites. So there is emails available to us. We just have have any training you know, to use it, okay? And then uh, I'm not which emails were you using when uh, that they, it was like somehow you, you got hacked. Either you got hacked or I got hacked or something. Else. Did anybody else get it? I'm not sure. But, I got uh, one. I got one too. So um, is it which are you using Colleen your personal email? Is that what it is? Oh, your PC email what they have. Okay, so. So, uh, what's interesting about this is that uh, it, I don't believe it came from PC. Maybe it was one of our personal emails. Um, the reason I say that is because at my other job, um, I've also received similar emails. They're from district court. They're from. So I think this is something that is ongoing. I it's did check around. with the. So if you're using a PC uh, server, mm -hmm. then that's through Ideal, correct? Yes. So you guys, and did you investigate and see where that was coming from? Are you, so, your firewalls are up, antivirus? Uh, so when someone spoofs an email and changes the name, like right. anyone can do it. You can't control what people can change and send out. Right. So the best way to check is just to verify with us or just read the sender. Usually the sender email is wrong. It right. doesn't relate to the name. Right. But then this is also happening to other Companies too. It's not just so I guess just as a precaution for all the commissioners, just uh, if ever you see something that has an attachment that they want you to open yes, uh, and sign, just because uh, that's when they get you. So once you open that attachment, then the virus is live in your PC. So if you read it, you're okay. But if you click on it and right. open up the attachment, that's when the problems happen. Right. So um, if you see, you feel uncomfortable about opening up something, you don't know why they you need to look at it or sign. Just look at who the sender is, and by clicking their name and then uh, looking at what address they're using, because even though it said my name was from some right, global, right. global something company from some scam site or whatever. And then, if I may, I, I should also add it doesn't necessarily mean that our email is compromised. It's just we are contacts of someone who was compromised. Correct. That's how they were able to use you know, our names. Yeah, or they've gone through the site. Because it's actually like PC business sometimes. Mm -hmm. that they'll, they'll, they're so clever that they already know right. what we're talking about. So that's why it makes me kind of comfortable. But hopefully, with the, um, the official PC emails, we can move forward from there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Go ahead, Doris. So, I guess the first question is when will we transition to well, the PC? I think we should work on this more aggressively now. Okay. And then the second question, though, just more there, you set, uh, at least that's what we knew from OPA, when you set the OPA emails, if someone changes somebody's name, that's automatically rejected because it's not going to be established. You can't, you know, just say, you know, uh, like now, I tried to do the rest more Brooks stuff at Bomb OPA. I would be rejected even though before I was in. So I was a little bit confused when you said someone could change the email. And they could spoof it. The they need, the visibly, they can change how it looks when they send it. I'm sorry? When they send it, they can change how it looks. The, like they can make it say anything on the name of the sender. Right. So but then they can't the, change the. But there, there, there is a possibility where they can also change the way, like he said, he received the email from himself. That person just changed it. Changed something. So I think what Doris is saying is that uh, in some uh, email firewalls or, or, or virus protections, that they're saying that if it's not part of our contact list, we don't want to receive it. Oh, yeah, there's a white list? There's a white list, yeah, correct. Yeah. So that's what she's referring to. But um, because we're a public entity, we, we get emails from everybody. And, and, I mean, maybe internally for us, you know, it's just the commission, but if you're using that out there, that email address, when we go to conferences and we're passing out, you know, the, 
in, in setting up relationships and talking to other regulators, then uh, if they send us an email, we don't know who that is. So we can't block or create a whitelist. No, no, no. I'm, I'm referring to, like, you know, hypothetically, you know, if we were using it, and it says Doris Flores Brooks, and then someone says Doris F. Brooks that Doris F. Brooks is not in the system. That's what I'm referring to. Because they won't change that. I mean, they won't change your actual email. They're just doing it on their own end when they send out email. Because, so that would be rejected as me receiving it because they're, I'm not Doris F. Brooks, I'm Doris Flores. Well, we should just reject all Doris Flores books emails. Yeah. <laughs> just kidding. Oh, when you write it wrong, yeah. It's, but, yeah it no, I, I don't out. know if there's a way to do that, though. Uh, to, for her, I mean, because it's not your name. If you're talking about your, the actual, like it says, Doris, no, I'm just, um, like, like, let's say your, your Gmail account. Uh, no, no, no. The account. Right. Whatever it is, whatever name we've established. Right. If someone were to try to change that, it would be automatically. Right. They're not. They're not changing it. So they're. Yeah. They're, they're not changing your email. So your your actual emails coming in are yours. So let's say we use um, uh, D period Brooks at puc right? Let's say we use that. Yeah. Nobody's changing your to okay. to Doris whatever it is. Yeah. What they're doing is they're using your real name Doris Flores Brooks and and using spoofing it with another email address that in the context so when you receive it it looks like it's yeah. coming from Doris Flores Brooks but if you look at the email address it'd be Doris at globalscam.com or whatever it is oh, I yeah. unless you look at it uh, open it up you won't know where that uh, what the email is so whenever you see like people on a CC list you can also look at what email they're using so that's one way to prevent it but, um, so talking about moving forward with uh, the pc.com emails uh, is 30 days unreasonable can we set up a time uh, next week where we could uh, get together with you and you could run us by our next process? meeting, maybe have all, all our emails sent? Yeah, I mean, uh, just let me know what you want your display name to be and what you want your email name to be. Most people just do the first letter, the first name, and their last name at Wildcock. Right. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. I can provide you guys with a, a website link that will teach you how to log into it on your phone or on your desktop. Okay. okay. So. Yeah, that's the hard part. Yeah, I have uh, instructions. Yeah, adding it to your phone, uh, adding it to yeah, your, yeah, your yeah. thing. So, is the server uh, is it a pop server? It's a uh, pop or IMAP, depending if you want a Microsoft Outlook email so it's, or it's just a regular. It's really easy to add to like an iPhone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just say it's a pop server. Or yeah, Gmail. I mean uh, the website link they provide you. They'll ask you what kind of phone you have, right. and then uh, if you're going to put it in your mail app or right. you're going to put your Outlook. Okay. They'll either ask you to put the server issue, the code, or okay. it'll just tell you just to log in directly. Okay. But the website link will teach you the whole thing, step by step, yeah. okay. with pictures. Well, so we this dinosaur room. needs to have you do it for. But I can do it in person too. Right. Yeah, yeah, don't ask fine. me to do all that because yeah. I'll get lost. My grandson is not with me. So anymore. we could set up uh, <laughs> like a, a, a training <laughs> day here. Sure. Or, yeah, or I could just come, yeah. come by. Yeah. Yeah. Or I could just, I could just help you. Just come to the office. Right, okay, perfect. So the PUC address was in compromise then? It's just your own? No, it was, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was Colleen sending out, hey, be careful. Uh -huh. and then, uh, then I think I sent something else about binders and thank you for your support. And then somehow they got a hold of that email, this, this is the second email that I looked at, and they wanted me to, it was an attachment, they wanted me to sign the document using that thread that I just talked to her about. So it looks like it was really an ongoing com conversational thread. Email thread, so it was kind of like, wow, we're getting really creative these days. Yeah, they're copying. So it's easier versus before it used to be spam, you know, like, yeah, oh, yeah. you know, the prince of whatever <laughs> Nigeria wants to give you a million dollars, click this. And yeah, okay, yeah. Great. And, but now they're getting clever. They're copying so, the emails. Yeah. Great. So we just got to be careful. Can I just add one more thing? Yeah. Change your passwords. Just change your passwords. Go ahead and change your passwords. To, uh, what, to our personal email? For your personal, the ones that you think might be compromised, just change your password. Yeah, exactly. Just do guys create one for me, remember for me. Okay.
Okay. Uh, next, automatic renewal of nine PUC consultant agreements for one-year terms commencing October 1st, 2022, unless terminated by PUC prior to commencement date. Fred? Okay. Uh, we went through this last year. So basically, there are nine consultant agreements. For power and water, we have Georgetown, Daymark, and Concentric Energy Advisors. For the Port Authority, we have Slater and Nakamura. For Telecom, we have Slater and Nakamura. For Guam Solid Waste Authority, we have MSW. That's six, the off-island consultants. And then the three on-island consultants, myself, Joe Fed, and Anthony Camacho. So, you remember in the past, every year at this time, we used to go through each contract and have resolutions and everything. Uh, it, it just seemed like a lot of paperwork. So we changed the agreement to provide for an automatic renewal unless prior to the end of September, one of the parties terminated. So uh, technically now you would have an opportunity to discuss any any contract and terminate it. But the, the contracts themselves provide, because it's a five-year term, basically. The way we've always done it, five-year five year total, but really one-year terms within that. So um, unless the commission takes action to terminate any contract, it will be renewed for one more year now, only one more year. And then next year, um, probably in February or so, the PUC will have to go out for new uh, consultant contracts, do a new procurement, because the five years will be up uh, a year a year from now. That's, I remember that's when we were, we were voting on, or we would uh, look at all the proposals and all the contracts that came with the consultants, and each of us would sit down and put a rating on it, and then you added it up, and that's how we decided as a commission which, yes. co which consultants we're going to use. And that'll be done next year. Okay. Right. We'll go through that whole process. Okay. Okay. Fred, are we going to oh, go ahead, Doris? This one question called Anthem. Okay. Uh, is it uh, because I saw on the Anthem website that you agree? So I'm just curious about can he still work? Yeah. Yeah. My understanding is that he worked out with UOG that he had existing contracts so that he was able and he still is uh, he he, do, he has done these two minutes that you had before you tonight you know, he's been preparing the minutes and I do assign him um, a contract matter contract review matters this month I wasn't sure when he got back because he was off island uh, I believe taking his daughter to college but um, so but he can still I believe uh, participate there may be a question next year. I, I that I don't know, but uh, we'll have to gather from him what, what he uh, wishes to do there. So, so is this a formal docket? Do we need to like, vote on it and move? To the uh, extent, or this is just a, a I don't think you have to do anything unless somebody were moving to terminate a contract. But otherwise, they just automatically renew. So you you don't need to take any. Okay. Action. Everyone's good. Yeah. Good. Next item, employment agreement for the PUC Administrator, Resolution 2201. Fred? All right, so our, our administrator is always on one-year contracts now. Remember, uh, she was converted from a uh, contract employee, to, or uh, a contract hire to, to an employee. To an employee. So, so starting, uh, I think, a couple of years now, we've uh, had our administrator, Ms. Palomo, on an employment contract. So this resolution, 22-01, just like last year, recognizes uh, she's been with the PUC for uh, 20 years now. Just turn the open pop up. And, and um, let's see. So this would basically um, authorize the PUC to hire her again for fiscal year 2023. And uh, her salary, um, it's recommended by the uh, budget committee that her salary be increased by $2,000. So the salary uh, will, will move up from 62000 to 64000 Now that includes 
6,000 for a benefits. It was determined previously that since the PUC can't provide insurance, uh, health care, or uh, other compensation benefits, that uh, that would be added in. We base that on certain federal uh, wage factors. So the resolution provides for that an annual salary of 64000 inclusive of the benefits. And then also I provided to you the employment agreement, which again is just the same as last year, um, it um, except for the salary, it increased it. Do we, do we, do we need to do this every year? I mean, now that we switched over to employee, I mean, isn't you just terminated upon you know, or, or resigned? I mean, at that point, if there's any issues, I mean, they're employees now; they're not contracts, contract workers. So, I mean, I don't go through my employees and rehire them every year. If they're an employee, I remember when there were contracts. Yes, you know, like your contracts, professional services. But if they're employees of the commission at this point, do we really got to review it every year and rehire them every year? It doesn't make sense to me. Uh, well, I, I always think it's advisable to have a good record, you right. know, of, of the hiring. And even as a contract employee or a contract hire, that's what we did. Because I mean, at this point, are we at will? Is this an at will employee? Yeah, it is. It is at will. The contract provides a, a termination on thirty days notice. Right. So there's a, but I. Okay. I don't know. I guess I just like the formality and okay. the uh, the procedure for, for knowing exactly where the commission is on. Okay. Is there a motion? Do you need one? Yeah. Yeah. We do need the uh, resolution twenty two zero one and the employment agreement to be approved. Uh, I'll move motion to approve resolution 2201. Second. Second. Pedro seconds. All in favor say aye. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Next item, continuation of part-time employment of assistant to PUC administrator, resolution 2202. Fred? All right. So, so here actually the way it had been instructed last time when uh, Cindy Brown had been hired, uh, there, there was not a contract, but there were just terms and conditions and an offer, a letter of, of employment. And um, again, just for the record, in, in resolution 2202, um, we're asking that, um, you know, um, sorry, that um, Colleen Santos, her employment be continued. There's no, no specific uh, term. Stated. Bless her soul. And uh, of course, she's just fairly recently been hired with the commission, doing a very good job. Awesome. And um, an excellent job. Excellent. Yes. Yes. So, so uh, of course, in the future, you will uh, certainly be able to consider increases in salary and, and benefits. But the uh, the salary now is based on a uh, thousand forty hours, a half half time employment. And uh, that's that. It's at a rate of twenty-two thousand eighty-nine dollars and sixty cents per year. Um, one additional benefit: uh, Ms. Clarson is receiving uh, fifty dollars worth of gasoline per month, and uh, that was taken out of the administrator's contract at her request. Previous contract had provided for that, right? So, but it's put back. Put back in. So for this one, I would ask you to uh, approve resolution 2202. Okay. Motion to approve resolution 2202. Thank you, Pete. Is there a second? Joe seconds. All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Next item is our budget review from the budget committee. Right. And uh, Fred and Lou and Doris and I participated in that. Generally the chairman and the CPA representative for the commission. Right. Go ahead. Fred. So there's really two steps to this. First of all, you have the budget before you uh, of the proposed FY 2023 budget. It's $5,000 less than the FY 2022 budget. And um, the first step is for you to consider approve if appropriate for budget. Go ahead. Uh, and this was just, uh, and this happened after we concluded uh, this 
talking to Lily about internet. And then she said, we don't have internet at the office. Is that right? And I was surprised. Because internet. She's got internet. I think she's got internet. She receives email. Huh? She has internet. She receives email. And she's got all, all she does online. She does all so her conferences. Each one of them were at 99 
with, along with GSWA? Yeah. yeah, I think last year we yeah, had a session that full year. Year. And we, we had two major dockets with them. And then now we're lowering them and increasing costs. So with the telecom companies, I've, I've explained in the assessment order, there, there are two elements. The companies themselves agreed to a baseline figure every year, which um, um, is a total amount of 45000 and then they broke it down between themselves. We had a docket on that. And then for, in addition to the 54000 we have to get up to 104000 so we, we determine how much each telecom company used our services in the past year and we allocate them. Usually comes up that GTA is uh, uh, the most and then we add that amount to their base allocation needs. And, you know, the, the details are, are expressed in the assessment order and we have an attachment which uh, kind of shows Hey Fred. The additional uh, amounts that each each of them pays. Now, you know, in the past few years, we haven't had much in terms of telecom dockets. Years ago, we had a tremendous amount and, and some really complicated dockets that went on for years. But uh, in the last few years, yeah, I'm surprised. I think uh, in the PBS, uh, the companies decided they didn't really want to pay the fees involved to uh, process some of these complaints and uh, disputes amongst themselves. So so now basically in the last two years anyway, it's been just the USAC petitions that we've yeah. handled. Uh, just point of clarification on the uh, assessment order, page two, whereas after due consideration, is that a typo, 405,000? Should that be 490,000? Oh, yes. uh, you're right, I'm sorry. Can I ask uh, my name be corrected? Which one? My name. My name. Uh, all your all your names. Okay. I was prepared to. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. That's right. Sorry, Roman. Okay. You divorced Roman. I think what I must have taken it from an old assessment order. Right. That's my uh, base. Get commissioners to sign it. Um, you can cross. You can, you can type it in, in later. She can write it into a page now. Fred, Fred, just let Rowena write it in. She'll just cross up there as they write Camacho. Yeah. Well, I, I wrote in. I wrote in Camacho. Right. Oh, okay. well, now you've ruined it. <laughs> Now she should initiate. Now Rowena is very upset. <laughs> so Rowena, you want it? Uh, how would you want it? Harris hyphen Camacho. Harris hyphen Camacho. Without the e. No, with the e. And then an exclamation mark at the end. <laughs> Move to approve. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. aye. aye.